Um, I'm Alexandra Sasha Slavkovic. I'm professor of statistics um, and the associate dean for research in the College of Science. I have the honor and privilege of welcoming you all in person here and on Zoom uh, to the first talk of the 2024 Ashtakar Frontiers of Science Lectures series as we celebrate the 30th year of the popular public winter series. The lecture series was founded by Abai Ashtakar in 1995, soon after he arrived at Penn State as director of the new research center that eventually evolved into the Institute of Gravitation and Cosmos. I would like to acknowledge and recognize Professor Ashtakar, who has actually joined us here this morning. Thank you again for founding the series. The series also owes its success to tireless efforts and meticulous planning of Barbara Kennedy, who presided over the series during its first 25 years, making it one of the most successful science outreach events in central Pennsylvania. The recognition of the milestone in recognition of the milestone anniversary, this year's lecture series titled, and stay with me, it's long, Exploring Scientific Progress Over Time, Revisiting Past Lectures on the 30th Anniversary of the Ashtakar Frontiers of Science. We look at how science has changed over the passage of time, including updates, breakthroughs, and how research fields have evolved. The series of lectures will look back at past topics, including updates for some speakers, as well as look ahead to the new advancements and future prospects of the impactful research in the college, across Penn State, and beyond. Today, and for the next five Saturdays, you will hear from researchers on topics that include the origin of cells, the earliest stars, galaxies and black holes, signals in the brain, energy and climate change, quantum computing, and gravitational waves. Given the special 30-year anniversary, the format of these lectures will look a little different than in past years. We have invited previous Ashtaka Frontier Science speakers and other experts to give an overview of past topics before introducing our main speakers. Today's lecture topic, Before Cells, how the components of life might have come together is being introduced by Phil Bovalacqua, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and Head of the Department of Chemistry. And the lecture will be presented by Chris Keating, Shapiro Professor of Chemistry. We are also thrilled that Professor Emeritus Robert Minard has joined us today. In 1996, Bob gave the original Frontier of Science lecture on this topic titled Chemical Evolution and the Origin of Life, Protons to Proteins. Please join me in uh, acknowledging uh, uh, Bob in his presence today. Following the lecture, graduate students uh, Lauren McKinley from Chemistry and Divya Singh from Physics, they're right here, will lead a, mod an, a moderated question and answer session with Professor Keating. Now I would like to welcome Phil Bavalakwa to give his introduction. Good morning. Um, it's it's a pr uh, privilege to be here and to speak um, and to uh, introduce um, my my colleague Chris Keating and um, close collaborator. Um, and I uh, would also like to thank Professor Ashtakar for setting up these lectures and. Uh, it's a very important way for us to communicate our science to the public. So thank you very much. Um, and in my introduction, I would like to talk about a few different topics, particularly about ribonucleic acids or RNA, something you're all familiar with now with the mRNA vaccines and with CRISPR and so on. It's a topic that has been very much in the news. And then a little bit about um, how life could have begun with chicken and egg problem, and then um, we'll, we'll come to this bizarre picture here in just a minute. So, um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, I wanna introduce you to RNA, ribonucleic acids are, they're biopolymers. And what a polymer is, is it's a molecule that's made up of monomers and they're arranged together as units. And so here, the monomer of RNA is called a nucleotide, and it's it's a it's it's a nitrogenous heterocycle. It's made of nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, um, some phosphorus, and some oxygen. Relatively simple, and it has it's it's linear. It goes in in a direction five prime to three prime, and it's made up of um, only four different monomers. Uh, so it's fairly simple. You see. Um, 
three of the four here, A, we'll just use their abbreviations, A, U, G, and there would also be C. And, and they come kind of in two sizes, this bigger size here, that's called a, an, 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 a purine, and they have two um, uh, rings that are fused together, or a single ring, the smaller ones, the pyrimidines, and those are U and C. So on the one hand, RNA is, is, is quite simple. It only has uh, four uh, different subunits, and two of them are similar, and the other two are similar. Um, next slide, please. And so one question then is, what kind of complexity and diversity can such a simple molecule potentially achieve? And so um, by, by comparison, let's start over here with a very familiar DNA made out of Watson, Crick, Franklin base pairs. And you can see the right-handed nature of the helix. And we have A, which I introduced you to, pairing with T, or G pairing with C. Most catalysis, most chemical reactions are uh, catalyzed by proteins. So what about RNA? What can it do? Well, it can do amazing things. So you can see the complexity of the structure here, very different from DNA, which uh, has an important but, but fairly uh, simple and, and, and unvarying structure. RNA can fold into these complex structures that are kind of globular, almost like a protein. They have an outside, they have an inside, and because they have an inside like that, they can do amazing things there. They can bind small molecules, they can catalyze chemical reactions. And these are just two examples. Not to, I won't get into the details, but here's an example of binding a small molecule, uh, which can then regulate um, uh, expression of a gene. And so um, RNA structure, uh, is more, to me, more protein-like than it is DNA-like. That, that was the point of the last slide. So probably many of you have seen this, or if you can take your mind all the way back to biology, maybe high school biology, um, you have the flow of information in biology, and that's what's captured in this slide. That's called the central dogma of molecular biology, and that is information is stored in DNA, and then over here on the other end is the molecule that was thought to do all the reactions, protein, and kind of RNA was thought to be kind of the, the middleman, not so important in the, in the center. But now we know that, in fact, RNA runs the show, okay? So RNA regulates the process of going from DNA into RNA. Um, it regulates going to, to proteins. There are many different kinds. I just show three kinds of RNA, but we know of over 20 different classes of RNAs now and it can control its own uh, transcription and degradation. So this is how I see the central dogma. It's really an RNA world. It's an RNA-centric way of, of doing things. On, the, on this slide, so I'll just give you an idea that RNA can fold, and there's a little movie here. And what you're gonna see is this single strand, pretty simple, that these regions are gonna come together. Red's gonna come with red and yellow with yellow. And if you want to start that, Heather, and this is um, this is not meant to be reality. It's more, you know, kind of a sci-fi thriller here, but um, but it gives you an idea of the types of shapes that RNA can assume. And so that that view of RNA kind of as a piece of cooked spaghetti or something like that that we often, or even uncooked spaghetti that we used to draw it as. We shouldn't draw it that way. We should think of it this way. And this L-shaped molecule, our, uh, molecular structure dictates function. And so, so this, of course, is transfer RNA, and it transfers the information in the mRNA. Down here is the anticodon that would base pair with the mRNA. And up here is where the amino acid would be uh, attached in, in the um, acceptor arm, and that is what would lead the protein to, to grow. Next slide, please. So RNA can adopt these complex structures. And to me, this is just fascinating that such a simple molecule can lead to such structural complexity and therefore such functional complexity. And so I just want you to check out some of the, kind of kind of less from the, the chemistry point of view and more maybe from the aesthetic point of view, the sorts of things that RNA is capable of. Um, and so you can see this, 
this L shape here and, and I've drawn it both as a stick and a space filling model. And I mentioned the anticodon and the acceptor stem, um, but uh, next slide, <clears throat> we can see it's built out of details that involve complex interactions of the bases. So here's a standard Watson, Crick, Franklin base pair, but we see a third base coming in to make a triplet. Okay, that's the type of complexity that we see. And then on the next slide, we can see even, um, and that just shows it in, in a sort of a more abstract kind of way. Um, we can see that there are many different interactions. These, these triples, next, uh, these, um, G not pairing with C, but pairing with some other base. It's called a wobble. Um, pairing with C, but in a but in a distorted way, a reverse way, with only two hydrogen bonds rather than the standard three. And over here, we see G pairing with A, a big base with a big base. Okay, so uh, next slide. So so the way the way I think about this is the way Picasso described art, and that is that everything you can imagine is real with RNA. It's, it's, it, it has to be chemically plausible. And as long as it's chemically plausible, it either happens or we don't know about it yet, is my view. Next slide. And so let's compare, we'll do a little score um, sheet here comparing DNA proteins and RNA. So uh, on the first row, um, we see what can be genetic material. Well, we know DNA can be, but proteins are not known. There's no way to go backwards from proteins. There's no reverse translation, but RNA can be genetic material. We all know this, for example, in terms of SARS-CoV-2, uh, the global pandemic, its genome is RNA. It's an RNA virus, next. And which can be an enzyme? Well, proteins, many enzymes, most enzymes, at least in modern life, are proteins, but RNA also can be an enzyme. That led to the Nobel Prize in 1989, showing that RNA can be an enzyme, um, and which can bind metabolites to regulate gene expression, while proteins do, and, and RNA does as well. So when we go down the columns and we see which of the three biomolecules have check marks in all three rows, it's only RNA. So RNA can be the genetic material, it can be an enzyme, and it can bind metabolites. And so then we talk about, well, which came first? Life requires enzymes to catalyze reactions quickly and specifically, and it also requires genetic material. And so proteins do this and DNA do that, but what can do them both? Well, of course, RNA can. So it's a way to resolve the chicken and egg paradox, and that is um, part of what drives our thinking in terms of an RNA world and what might have been and what currently is all within the Venn diagram of what must be as chemists possible. And so, um, so last thing in terms of thinking about what we call then an RNA world, an early form of life where RNA was playing all of these roles, not necessarily by itself, but key, is we see remnants of this in a lot of the cofactors in, in modern life. And so um, I just want to say a word about the prebiotic wor world. And so molecules used by modern biology are found in extraterrestrial objects. And so here's uh, a meteorite, the famous Murchison meteorite, which was found in Australia in the late 1960s. And um, it's carbon rich and it contains some of the key molecules of life, amino acids and nucleobases. And we can see some of them here. We can see the fused purines and so on. They came to earth in meteorites, okay? So that doesn't mean though that, that that's how life started. It's one hypothesis. Another is that simple chemical reactions can lead to the nucleobases. And so, so Bob Menard, uh, emeritus professor of chemistry um, who um, we were introduced to briefly. Um, Bob spoke in this, this lecture series as uh, we said about 30 years ago. And, and um, I love this picture. I, I couldn't get a high res picture of this, Bob, but, but I love this. It's just like, you know, like I'm, you know, I don't know, it's just feeling really proud and kind of tough and, and cool. And, you know, I, I looked up Bob's um, CV and, and Bob, Bob is, uh, is a teaching professor, but he has, was also very research active. Bob had over a hundred publications. It's amazing, um, truly amazing. And, and one, one time he came to my group 
and you gave a lecture to my group, I don't know when that was, 15 years ago, about your research. And Bob's research was, uh, was centered on uh, the chemical synthesis, the chemical origin, uh, not, not by humans, but by, by natural, uh, early, on the early, early earth, that through natural ways and small molecules could have led to the, the, um, the nucleobases, which are the building blocks of RNA. Where did it come from, right? And so, so here's, here's some examples on elucidation of um, hydrogen cyanide polymers and, and using hydrogen cyanide to try to look at where the bases came from. And, and that's one of, um, one of the other ways in which the, the building blocks of life could have come. Um, and simple molecules, there's some discussion now, we collaborate now with geologists and chemists and biologists and astrobiology to look at different atmospheres and how simple molecules like made out of three different um, uh, elements and three atoms here could have led to those nitrogenous heterocycles. And I'm not gonna go through any of this other than to say Bob's work was, was very important in seeing ammonia and formaldehyde, these simple, very simple molecules and how those pathways could have led to the building blocks of life, okay? And so then on the next slide, um, oh, keep going, these should have been blocked out, one more. Okay, um, I would wanna just take a minute to say a word about my colleague, Christine Keating. And Chris is gonna tell us today more about the compartments and the pro what we call protocells. And, and these are sort of the, the vessels that the RNA could have been in to do its, do its chemistry. Um, and um, I just um, thought I would mention a few of the um, publications that Chris and I have, have written together over the last decade. Um, and, and you can see the combination of RNA, which um, catalyzes reaction, and it goes inside these, these various sort of units. These here are um, two-phase systems, and here this uh, elucidates the, the, the sort of primitive cells, and this shows that RNA is inside, and then uh, here is no reaction, and then when we put the RNA inside of these, the reaction starts to happen or happen much faster. And then uh, uh, more, more recently, how um, other types of, um, types of vessels and early cells and protocells could have um, brought in RNA, which is in green, and it's not folded correctly, and by different additives allows it to fold and become catalytic. And then one last one, this is kind of moving. The first one was 10 years ago, that last one was five years ago, and this is this year, the end of last year, and that is moving and combining the, the protocells, the RNA folding, and then big data next-gen sequencing to look at how RNA could fold inside of peptide-rich droplets, particularly those tRNAs, those L-shaped molecules that I told you about. So, um, so I'm gonna hand this over to Chris, um, but before that happens, I'll just say a couple of words that it's, it's been um, a, a, a real pleasure to, to work with Chris for me personally over the last decade. Um, there's, there's lots of reasons that we collaborate with different people. Um, the ideas are exciting. Um, we, our research complements each other. But, but for me, the biggest reason that I like to collaborate with Chris is, is how creative and you'll see and how visionary she is. And for me, working with her has led to better science, really has made me a better scientist. And, and you'll see, um, too, that her, set you up here, Chris, that her talks are, are very, very engaging. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing your talk, Chris. So, so let's welcome Chris Keating. So when we get like uh, three quarters of the way through, I'm going to toss some slides out on the wayside and it'll be all good and we'll make up for it. So, <laughs> so thanks for your patience and thanks so much for coming Saturday morning for lunch to hear about. Oh, so again, sorry for the delay, but it's okay because the delay is for like cool compartments full of RNA and like hopefully that'll all be worthwhile because compartments full of RNA are arguably the best kinds of compartments. And so I uh, mean, unless they were full of like chocolate or something. But um, yeah, so that's what I'd like to tell you about today is thinking about we now are motivated to put RNA inside of something because we had to eventually get it inside of cells. We're all made of cells. And so there was RNA and it supposedly could solve all of our problems. So good. 
How do we get it inside of cells? And that's not necessarily an easy thing to figure out, but let's try. Because I'm sure we can have this done and dusted by lunch, even though we had a delay, right? Sorry. You have to work so much more today than you should have. <laughs> so yeah, so this is how it happened, of course. Like, yeah, done and dusted. Um, first, you had to have a place, a habitable world. And then that world like had prebiotic synthesis, which is not actually as hard as it sounds, but it's not that easy. Um, and then you get bigger stuff and the bigger stuff starts to stick together because big stuff does tend to stick together. And then uh, something happens and then you have life. So we could just stop there, right? That's that's good. Um, next one. Yeah. Ooh, that's fun. I'm glad you already saw this meteor because that's not how it looks. Is this going to happen on all the slides? We'll see. A little, a little mystery for us. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, I, I had to show a picture of Stanley Miller, uh, the experiment that Professor Bob Lockwood just showed us about zapping things with fake lightning um, in an atmosphere meant to mimic that on the Hidian Earth when we think that these molecules were doing this. Um, he looks pretty pleased with himself too, actually, if you, <laughs> maybe that was just the look like. I, and, and meteors, this is the same exact picture of the same exact meteor, so I'm not going to say it all again, but it's shocking how much carbon is in these carbonaceous meteors. I just can't get over it. And the, the carbon is compounds that you're like, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, amino acids. Great. Nucleotides. Sure. Uh, this is pretty exciting. If you haven't been paying attention to NASA, like seriously, put a thing in your computer and start paying attention to NASA because this will make you feel better about the world. It's amazing the things that humans are doing. Not all the things humans are doing are depressing. <laughs> This thing is not depressing. It's very cool. NASA was like, you know, it's kind of stinks that the meteors come down and like land on the earth and we have to go pick them up and look at them because then maybe they get all dirty with our like living crap and then we think it's from the earth, you know, someplace else, but it's really from here. Wouldn't it be nice if we like go out into space, and like collect some and bring it back? Like, yeah, let's do that. And they did. That's pretty cool. This stuff, this is before they had it open. This is the bit that like mooshed out on the outside of the little container that came back. And so they got to this part first. They've gotten into the inside part, like, I don't know, last week or the week before, because this came down in, I think, October. You could like watch it in the in the YouTube. It's pretty cool. I watched it, like coming down, landing. Ooh, there it is. It's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, there's stuff inside. And this stuff is kind of like that stuff. I mean, we don't really know yet because they're analyzing it very, very carefully in glove boxes and such. And we're going to find out like what was on Bennu some asteroid and we went and we got a piece and we brought it back. That's cool. And so this kind of thing is gonna inform the future. What kind of molecules people will think about, you know, 10 years, 20 years from now will be informed by what we're finding in this way. Can you hit the button? And oh, we're missing a lot of the bottoms of things. It's, yeah, it's for tall people today. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so much of the world for tall people. I wanted to show you this to say that this isn't the only place that potentially life could happen. We don't know about life anywhere else, but we think about it. We like more than just me. I, I don't actually honestly think about it that much, but there are people who spend their lives thinking about it and they look out in the space and they think, yeah, there's some other planets there, loads of them. Which ones are like possible? So if it's too close to a star, like mm, too hot. And I don't just mean like summer hot, like too, just no, no life could be there hot. Too far from a star, like mm, too cold, no life could be there. In between, you know, maybe. Or like if there could be some sign of liquid water, maybe. And we'll work pretty hard for liquid water. Like I'll call it if it's in an aerosol, I'll call it if it's like real high pressure under the ground, like that could still work. And so if you do that, then you start to make lists. This list came from Wikipedia this week. It's a pretty long list. It's too small to read, but it doesn't matter. The point is there's a list and it's pretty long and it's getting longer all the time. The more we send telescopes up that can see further and look around, like, oh, so many exoplanets, like a fair number of them seem potentially habitable. I mean, it's a low bar. All we're saying is it's not a ridiculous temperature, but still. There's a lot. The universe is big. NASA's making travel posters. Actually, you can go see other travel posters on their website. And that's because they're just really good at public outreach, right? Because one of the reasons that it's important to think about astrobiology, so life in space and the origins of life, life here starting, which is kind of the same question both, is that it's really interesting. And it can excite people about science who wouldn't otherwise care. And it can get people to want to do, let's say, physical chemistry or organic chemistry or other cool things that they might not have otherwise considered. And so thinking about those places, even if we might not get to them in our lifetimes, is definitely worthwhile. Can you hit the button for us again? It's going to be all just the tops of things. <laughs> um, that's OK. You know what the bottom of this looks like. It's fine. 
someday there's going to be something on the bottom that we're going to be sad about, but not yet. So, and so what you're seeing here, obviously, is the one place we know life did happen. And so if we're trying to think as chemists how to run an experiment that could teach us something about how life might have started, we need some kind of constraints. We can't just be like, well, anything is game. It's nice sometimes if anything is game. Like, But you have to go in the lab and do an experiment at some point. It would be nice if someone could tell you something about what you should do. And so constraining by at least like, okay, this is a place that there is life. So let's say it started here. I guess it could have come in on an asteroid, but like, okay, let's just say it started here. It's easier to think that way. And we can have some knowledge of what it was like here when those molecules had to get together and how it could have started. So we can give ourselves some constraints. Hit the button and we'll see what comes next. Oh, that showed up. All right, good. Awesome. <laughs> So if, if you hang out with geochemists, and, and I recommend that, um, they will say, hey, there's a lot of places on, on the earth that life could start. Historically, we very much as a, as a field were, um, you know, Charles Darwin had that letter that he wrote, I forget to who now, like, oh, could you imagine some warm little pond and the, the molecules would get together and like whatever, and then life would start. Um, so this idea of a warm little pond, that language coming from Darwin, is really stuck with the field and it's still on my slide today, right? Um, and this really shaped our thinking for a long time that there'd be some kind of little pond and inside the pond, there'd be all those prebiotic molecules that we could make or we could get from meteors or whatever. And then they would do all the things and they would turn into life and they would crawl out of the pond and that's the end of it. But the geochemists say, yeah, okay, maybe you have a pond. Some of the geochemists say, yeah, you don't have a pond. We don't like to talk to those ones. We like a pond, us chemists, because it does this drying thing, which is really important. But anyway, whatever. So maybe there's a pond, maybe there's not a pond. There's definitely an ocean. Everyone agrees about the ocean. Um, there was definitely hydrothermal activity. So there's probably some volcanoes in the ocean, some thermal vents, maybe something was going on there. If you have an ocean and you have rotation, you're gonna have waves. If you have waves, you're gonna have aerosols. So there are definitely aerosols. So there are definitely places that things could happen and we should think about all those places. I'm really just gonna still think about the pond today, but in my lab, we're thinking about these other places too. We just haven't thought about them long enough to have much to say yet. Um, Cause even the pond, right? These, these are questions are not trivial. And so it's taken us some time. Okay. Yeah, so I wanted to have some kind of overview picture. You know what I wish there was is a big clock in the back of this room. You should start yelling at me to tell me what the time is. Yeah. <laughs> Um, at any rate, so this is a picture I was able to download. Actually, Kate Adamal is a friend, so we collaborate together. She's in Minnesota, and she made this based on what a lot of people thought about how life could have started. And what you should notice is, okay, so stuff comes from comets or meteors or organic chemistry, maybe in a pond, maybe in the sky, who knows. And now suddenly there's carboxylic acids and amino acids and nucleotides and all the fun stuff you need. And then they get bigger. They can oligomerize. This part is really important and a lot of people are studying it. It's hard to make them really long, but that's not kind of my problem today. So I'll just act like it's a solved problem. None of these are really solved problems, but um, that's why it's so much fun. And then they get together in ways, you can see there's a lot of arrows here. People don't agree on what the most likely ways were. If you think about it, that's maybe not so surprising. Oh. Uh, one of the ways is membrane compartments. You can start to make these things into membranes and then the membranes, ooh, they fall apart at the bottom, but you kind of get the idea this stuff goes inside them and turns into life. And the part that I really want to think about is how are we going to get this part that's blurry on here, which I guess conceptually, it's not bad that it's blurry. It's kind of fits my thinking. So, <laughs> oh, I guess it's going to get better. We'll see what happens. All right, I'll say one more thing about this. So basic functions that we wish all, wish all these molecules would do, there's a lot of them, right? You think about all the things you might like a protocell or a cell to do or your own body to do. It's a long list. But if you're really forced to think about what you could give up and what you really, really need, well, you really, really need something that can make reactions happen. You need some kind of catalyst. And you really, really need something that can carry information. And if you don't have those things, there's like nobody who's going to agree that that is something that could turn into life. And so if we just say, make that the list, right? That's long enough. We already don't know how to do it. So what molecule could do that? Well, as Professor Babalaka was just saying, RNA is a good candidate. And so this idea of an RNA world, people like to call things a world. We have icy worlds, we have rocky worlds, we have RNA worlds, we have protein worlds, everything is a world. So this RNA world idea is that RNA was playing that role because RNA is not so hard to imagine having made uh, abiotically on the early earth and that it could do these things. And then maybe 
as it tries to do them. It's maybe not so good at it. Maybe it's not as good at being information carrying as DNA, but that's okay. DNA can come along later. And maybe it's not as good at doing the things proteins do as proteins are, but that's okay. Proteins can come along later. And so that's something that we're looking at, thinking about how this is going to evolve over time in terms of the molecules. Can we do it yet? Okay. Woo, the bottom shows, yay. I was glad you didn't have this in yours because I thought you might. I put it in after I sent my slides. Oh, so this is a, a cool idea that I got from someone down at Georgia Tech, Nick Hud, who does a lot of work in nucleic acids and prebiotic chemistry. Ooh, we have a backup. Ooh, that was quick. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, um, what, what Nick said, and, and, and he's not the only one who thinks this, is that we shouldn't necessarily think that we're constrained by the molecules we have now. So on the last slide, we're like, well, we need proteins, we need nucleic acids, and, and so on and so forth. And that's what we look for on the meteors and in the experiments. But it didn't need to be those molecules, right? There's no reason that RNA or its precursor back in the day had to be just like RNA now. Um, this is, I think, a DNA example in, from Nick Hud's paper. But the idea is you have some kind of thing that, notice you can't really draw it. He doesn't know how to draw it. It's just some shapes. So they're just vague shapes. And basically what, what Nick is saying, there, there are these stories. There's a lot of these stories. There's a much more complicated ones about boats that I forget the name of. But the idea is there's a guy and he says, hey, I have this ax. I'm really proud of this ax. I inherited it. It was my grandfather's ax. Now, it's true that you know my father replaced the handle, I couldn't remember who replaced what. My father replaced the handle and I replaced the head. But it's it, it's very precious to me, my grandfather's ax that I inherited. And you might, listening to this, say, yeah, but there's only the two parts of an ax and you replace both of them, so not your grandfather's ax. Um, and this apparently is a big thing philosophers spend a lot of time thinking about, but it was like the more complicated things that have more than two parts. Um, but that kind of thinking can work for prebiotic chemistry as well, right? RNA didn't need to be RNA. It just had to be something that could sort of do the work of RNA until we could have RNA. And if we think about the molecular evolution of it, the bar was low before there was anything. And so it didn't need to be very good to be better than what was there before if nothing was there before. And eventually something better will come along and then, okay, swap out whatever this mystery thing was for some real thing. Um, and there may have been many, many different kind of real things in there over time uh, is the thinking. It makes sense, right? That you could still have a working system and be replacing the chemical parts with other parts, not on purpose, but just because that happens because the, the new parts work better. So this thinking sort of holds for nucleic acids, but it all, also holds for the compartments I'm gonna talk about. Um, the compartments I'll talk about are two things that if you take out a piece and replace it with a different chemical structure of a piece, will still basically do the function. It won't be the same, it'll be different, but it won't be different in the sense of not being that thing. And so this is a way of like maintaining your structure while still having different capabilities. So there's a way for selective pressure to act on this and have it change over time, which is important because otherwise we would never get here. So, well, you can't hit the button for me. You can hit the button from both sides. Okay, so back to here. I want to put them in the compartments now. You can hit the slide again. Okay, why do you want to be in a compartment? I mean, I, I find compartments sufficiently motivated all by themselves. Anyone been to the container store? <sighs> Compartments, yeah, they're the best. Oh, but, but for life, also compartments are very important. I, I could go on all day about it, but we got a late start and you don't have all day and lunch is after me probably. So here's just a couple of reasons why you might want to put things in a compartment and you being just the molecules um, and the things being molecules. So if you would just have a few of the molecules and they're spread out in a big, like so let's say ocean and they're not very close together, a lot of reactions that they would do can't happen, right? Like the thing can't react with the other thing because it's too far away. You have to wait a really long time for them to bump into each other. If you put them in a compartment, well, now the concentration is higher. And so it might go faster. Many reactions go faster when the concentration is higher. And so you could have the compartment having more products than the no compartment example. So there's a good reason. That's a one of the more sort of attractive reasons. Um, or maybe the compartment is where your molecule is very happy. Those are happy molecules right there. <laughs> These guys are okay too until something bad happens and then, oh, not okay anymore. But these guys are still cool. They're good. Um, some of the compartments in our bodies work in those ways. Um, and so there are a lot of other things you might imagine, like the environment inside the compartment is different. That's why these guys are okay and they're not. 
but maybe that different environment, the microenvironment of the compartment, maybe it has a different polarity, maybe it has a different pH, different salt concentration, different reactive groups nearby. And so that can really change the reactions that you get. The button for me. Oh, whew. yes. Okay. And then if you have a compartment, the compartment could do things that we think of cells wanting to do, right? We could have a compartment that could grow and divide. It's not actually that easy to do that. People try hard, um, but in principle, you could do that. You could have a compartment that now brings it together, a group of molecules, so that selective pressure can act on them together and not individually. And so those things are going to be important for thinking about prebiotic chemistry. Yeah, so how do we do it now? We, us, our cells, how do they do it now? Like they don't maybe talk to us about it, but this is what they do. They have membranes, and then they have these other things called uh, membraneless organelles or liquid droplets. I'm a physical chemist. I love a liquid droplet for my phase separation. It's awesome. Um, anyway, lipid membranes, maybe you're familiar with, probably people made you memorize some of the parts of the cell at some point, and it would have been these parts. Nobody knew about these parts. Um, that's like 15 years ago, the biologists finally started getting on board with that. I will say, 1920s, the chem chemists and physicists were kind of already on board with it. Just, yeah. Anyway, but, but the biologists were a little slow. Well, they wanted proof, right? Um, and I, I think they're not all on board yet, but most of them, most of them now think they have enough proof that, okay, yeah, all these membraneless organelles are liquid, fine. That's important. So both of these things are happening in our cells today and like all of your cells. I think this one may not be happening in your eye lens because uh, that would make it hard to see through because the droplets are sort of microns and they scatter light. But um, in the nucleus of your cells and the cytoplasm of your cells, in the cytoplasm of bacterial cells, in plant cells, there's like loads of these little compartments. And there's also loads of membranes inside of all the eukaryotic cells, all the ones that aren't just bacterial cells, so plants and animals, fungi. The outside membrane is on all the cells. And so these are things that are pervasive in biology today that are organizing materials. And so the maybe more obvious one is the lipid membranes. So one of the coolest things that, that I learned when I was new to this is that if you just get some lipid, like you can buy lipid, but I guess whatever, you could wait for a meteor to fall in your yard, there's lipid there too. And uh, if you have that lipid and you dry it down and then you add some water, you don't even have to go away and come back. You can just stay right there and watch it. And like turns into membranes, that's amazing. Um, and so this is a thing that wants to happen. This is spontaneous. The, the lipids, right? They have these little heads here and they have these little tails. And on the next slide, I have a picture of what the molecule would look like, but. The, the heads are hydrophilic and the tails are hydrophobic, and that makes them want to assemble such that the hydrophilic parts are touching the water and the hydrophobic parts are touching each other and not touching the water. Or maybe more accurately, the water doesn't have to touch them. And so you get these enclosed structures that are lipid bilayers. And that's what our membranes are today, but also we think about that being a way to make membranes back then. And what's great, they're like cell membranes. They can grow and divide. I'm not gonna show you stuff about that today on account of time, um, but they can, which is pretty nice. And they're semi-permeable. They can sort who comes in and who comes, who doesn't come in. So for example, if you were able to put RNA in this compartment, it wouldn't be able to get out, but like nucleotides might be able to get in because they're smaller. And so that's pretty nice and could be useful. And so this is a really simple fatty acid, this guy um, that forms these on its own. And then this is a meteorite extract. I can't remember which meteorite it was. It might've been Murchison, but it could have been another one. Um, and it also, you can extract the lipids and they will self-assemble to form vesicles. So like, that's pretty plausible. Okay, that's a thing that can happen. This is some stuff that was inside. I forget what the stuff was, just some labeled fluorescent molecule and it was inside, so good. There's the molecules. So some of the folks here probably wanna see chemical structures and some of you probably got dragged by people who wanna see chemical structures and you're like, look away, that's fine. Like, just look at the colored part and you're good. Likes the water, doesn't like the water, yeah. And so, and then if you go and you look with electron microscope, so this is with the fancy new cryoems we have now uh, at Penn State, and those are some vesicles that are made of these kinds of guys. Um, they're pretty small. You can also get bigger ones. I don't know, this doesn't show up super well, um, but this is some, a, a mixture of lipids that have this head group and then another head group that's uncharged that um, an undergrad, uh, Zane in my lab is doing. Um, and this is a fluorescence microscope picture. The point being that they can span the range of sizes and you can use different molecules to make them. These phospholipids with the two acyl chains, those are considered modern uh, lipids that our modern membranes are made of. 
they're not pure membranes. We got some of these in there too, right? But but it's thinking the thinking is there probably wasn't a load of phosphate around early on. And so maybe you didn't have a lots of uh, lipids made with phosphate. And it's easier to have one chain than two chains, just like in a sort of obvious like synthetic sense, like you probably have one before you have two. So probably that molecule is a little more plausible. And so the prebiotic folks like to think about these guys, but they work fine. But then coming back to the, the ax, so we have this membrane and it's made of, let's say these guys and molecules can get through. It turns out these guys don't make, you know, really high quality membranes in the permeability sense. So they let kind of big stuff through. They have really strong flip-flop, like the molecules are moving around, they're coming in and out and little molecules can get through. Even kind of big molecules can get through. But then if you had a few of these that had the two acyl chains, they're better at making membranes. It's a bigger challenge for them to come out into the water because this greasy part is bigger. So they don't want to do it thermodynamically, they don't want to do it. And so they stabilize the membrane, even when they're there in a small amount, and then they eventually become the major component. So this is a picture from the Showstack lab where they're sort of giving us this idea that I would very much put in the, in the thinking of the grandfather's ex, right? It had one kind of behavior and then it changed to having another kind of behavior because we're still here. Yeah, We moved from here to there, but we kept the fact that we had a membrane, but we changed its properties. And, and we changed those properties in a way that if you think about it, it's very convenient because when we have a crappy membrane early, we also have crappy everything else. And so it would be a mistake to seal it off too well because we need stuff to leak across because we don't have enzymes yet. We don't have metabolism yet. None of these things are worked out. And so if you seal this thing off too soon, that's the end of it. And so it's actually pretty convenient that everything was bad together before it became better. Um, okay, now we can go forward. One thing that's bad about membranes, because I've been saying how great they are, they're really hard to put stuff in because you make a membrane, and if you think about it, the most obvious way for it to work out is that the concentration of stuff you have outside, the solute, whatever the green stuff is here, it's a dextran polymer, it doesn't matter, um, that it'll probably be inside at roughly the same concentration that it was in the solution before the vesicles form. And you might be like, great, it got in, like here, oh, look, there's the same amount of green stuff inside as outside, like great, I succeeded. But think about it. How many of these really good RNA molecules do you think you had in the ocean? Enough that it was okay to just catch them by chance? Like. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, you probably need to concentrate them if this is ever going to work. And the bigger they get, the harder it is to get them to go in. These don't even go in at the same concentration as outside. What's different is the molecules getting bigger. So this is a relatively small dextran, bigger one, bigger. These are really quite big. Um, and so as you get to bigger molecules, it's harder to put them in, which well, is disappointing because we want them in even more then. Um, so this is one problem with vesicles that it would be nice to have a solution to. Okay. Okay. And here is what I'm going to say is my solution. And I have too many slides on this. So I'm going to have to, in my head, think about which ones you don't need to hear, but this one you need to hear. So if you have polymers that are sticky, they will stick together. And if they're the right amount of sticky, and by, by that I mean, if they stick too much, they'll just make a precipitate. And precipitates aren't that fun. If they don't stick enough, they won't do anything. And that's not that fun. But if they stick dynamically, so they're constantly sort of sticking and unsticking along their length, they can make sort of this... Um, dynamic mesh structure that actually can be a liquid and make liquid droplets. And those are the ones we want to talk about. So the picture looks kind of the same because all you would change is how long it is and what the charge group is and how far apart they are. Um, but you can make, really with very little effort, mix polymers together, get multiple uh, phases forming. Here's phases that are rich in, I think those are peptides. And the reason I can't tell and I have to think is because you can make them out of like, oh, anything. Um, and I have pictures of so many. I'm like, which picture was that? I don't remember. There's too many polymers. They all do this, whatever. Um, and so that's the kind of thing you need, though, if you're trying to have a prebiotic compartment. You need something that really wants to happen. And it wants to happen across a lot of molecules that are just sort of generally similar. And so I've done this with charge because I only want to talk about charge today, but it doesn't need to be charge. Uh, it just makes my life simpler. If we only talk about one kind of interaction. Um, okay. So what's great, they're like intracellular organelles. They concentrate biomolecules extremely well because these droplets, that's like basically all the polymers make the droplet. It still has water in it, 40% by weight water, 60, 80, depends how sticky they are. Um, but molar concentrations of the side chains of those polymers, so really concentrated. And they can bring in other solutes up to those concentrations as well. So that's great. And it's a new environment, different polarity, different all sorts of stuff, great. But it, you know, fundamentally it's liquid droplets. So imagine your salad dressing, like you shook it, it's got drops, and then you put it down like, oh, shake it again. Um, 
So that's disappointing, right? It would be hard then to have evolutionary pressure uh, selection happen on these droplets if they're just turning into one big pool. So, but... And this is for the chemists, like there's phase diagrams, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then they, they have structures for real, like you can use lots of things, but there's some examples, but um, I will not belabor that. So we can hit the next one. Okay, so if you've ever heard of these things before, uh, these coacervate droplets they're called, it's because of this fellow, he popularized them a really long time ago. So long ago that maybe you haven't heard of them. And so Alexander Oparin said, hey, that's how life started. And basically he looked at what this guy was doing. They look like a lot of fun at parties, don't they? Um, so he looked at what this guy was doing. So Bungerbird Jean found these guys, which was basically polymers sticking together, the thing I just showed you. And he took pictures of them and like, oh, they look. So back in the day, what people would say when they saw that is they would say, that looks like cells. That must be how life started. And then they would write a paper, like literally like a nature paper. And they'd be like, hmm, we're done. Our work here is done. And so he found these and he said, oh, you know what? I looked at some protoplasm, the stuff inside of cells, and it looks kind of the same. He was already saying there's membraneless organelles basically back in the 1920s. And everyone's like, yeah, whatever. And so, but this fellow said, yeah, that, okay, that's life right there. Got it figured out. He wrote a bunch of stuff. So he's famous for postulating the coacervate origins of life. Uh, he had a lot of good ideas. Some of the experiments he was able to do back then are like not so convincing now, right? But uh, people do what we can with what we have at the time and with our understanding. His thinking back then, we didn't know about DNA being the information molecule. We didn't know about lipid self-assembly. And I heard this fantastic story about Alexander Oparin. Um, he said late in life, uh, yeah, you know what? I should have studied lipids. That would have been better. <laughs> They're so cool. I should like this coacervate stuff, like, oh, whatever. I should study lipids. So we can hit the button. And so uh, come, let's come back to the soup here. Um, our, our warm little pond or our primordial soup from the early earth company. And um, so we got the molecules and now we have two kinds of compartments we can make. And I want to think about the coacervate compartments. I, I want to see my clock. And now I have to do math. It's hard. <laughs> okay. All right, so take us forward and I'll see where we want to be. Oh yeah, we're going to put some coacervates in there and see what happens. And then go forward again. Okay, so there's the droplets. There's some RNA, it's red in the droplets. Actually, it's peptide, but the RNA is in there too. And this is uh, a very tiny thumbnail of the things that Professor Babalaka was saying, which is to say you could put RNA in there. And when you do that, you can make the reaction go faster. You can, it doesn't always go faster. Sometimes it kills the RNA and makes it go slower. What does kills mean before life? It means the molecule unfolded. It doesn't have that beautiful structure that he showed and it can't do the thing it's supposed to do. Like it can't bind some substrate. It can't do um, catalysis. It couldn't find its, its complementary friend to carry information. Uh, and the reason for that, the reason for the good things and the bad things is that RNA sticks to the polycations. So it's a polyanion. He likes to think about it in terms of its beautiful three-dimensional structure. I'm a physical chemist. I like to draw like literally the limp spaghetti and think of it having negative charge all along the length and see how far I get with that. And you know what, further than you'd think. So, <laughs> but sometimes you can't get any further and that's where the fun is, right? When you find out it's not enough that it's a polyanion, that it's important that it folds. And this is a case where being a polyanion gets it in the coacervate. And the better it is at being a polyanion, the more unfolded it is, the better it gets in the coacervate. That's great. Now you can put all the RNA in like, you can put it in, you can concentrate it to five orders of magnitude higher concentration of RNA inside than outside. And you'd think like, hey, that's great, I'm awesome. But you know what, if you put it in that well, it is all dead. None of it's gonna do anything. It's way too stuck to the co to the coacervate components. And so it can't fold on with itself. And so you have to sort of walk this line and find that intermediate zone where it's brought into the compartment, but it's not then inactivated by too strong of interactions. And we've spent a lot of time like finding out where that is and learning how to study that, that I will not belabor on account of the time. That's fun, but it's too complicated. Let's hit the button. Actually, we'll leave the bottom part. Yeah, we'll go back and I'll look at the bottom part. I'll skip that. This is data. Just believe me. Um, what we did is we asked the question. Yeah, just believe me. What we did is we asked the question, if you made these compartments, these coacervates out of little small molecules instead of great big molecules, because probably they were little small molecules, right? At the beginning and not big molecules because probably small ones came first. What would the consequences of that be? And as a physical chemist and knowing the phase diagram, I thought these consequences would be unpleasant for me, i.e. the inside and outside of the compartment would be kind of similar and probably the RNA wouldn't go in very good and it would be disappointing. Um, and it turns out the RNA goes in better. These are like going longer this way, um, longer this way. The RNA gets compartmentalized uh, better for the short ones than for the long ones. So that's interesting. I can explain why, but 
just believe me, I guess. Uh, and then interesting things happen with the stability of duplex formation. So the ability of the RNA to bind to itself, to, to its friend RNA, which presumably also speaks to how it would fold onto itself, but that's a harder experiment to do in the lab. And so what we can think about is the same thing we just talked about with membranes and that we just talked about with nucleic acids, this whole ax business, that you can start out and you have really, really short molecules that make the compartment. And those short molecules may not be as good at bringing the RNA in, but because they're so short, the RNA wants to be in there really long, well. So here, the shorter ones bring in more RNA. And that's because this aspartic acid fivemer is easier to displace from the polycation than this aspartic acid 100-mer. And so the RNA doesn't have to be very long to win that battle because it's fighting against something short. And so it gets in there and it's gonna preferentially retain the longer ones. It'll be very sensitive to their length when it's short. And then as the molecules that are going in the capacitivate and the molecules it's made of all get longer together, which presumably they kind of did, um, that will destabilize the RNA more and more. That's what we're seeing over here. And that destabilization, it didn't happen here. We probably needed the RNA to stick like with whatever it had because it probably didn't have much. And now maybe it's gonna stick too well and misfold. And this can then be sort of melted in place. And then ultimately try to grow into something like uh, molecular recognition, this, this part, um, you could put in the big question marks there, right? <laughs> but you can see the same kind of progression coming that we saw with the other compartments and also with the nucleic acids. Okay, let's see the button. And then let's skip that one. It's fun, but we'll skip it. Phil talked about this, so I'm going to skip it too, but it was really cool. He has this way of knowing exactly how the RNA folded when it's in the compartment. It's extremely cool. Um, and then I guess I'll say one thing about this. So here's our pond again. And I said, we really want the pond, us chemists. We want it because it dries, at least in our minds, right? You could have a wet dry cycle and you wanna have a wet dry cycle because you have molecules that you wish would stick together. So these are amino acids and we'd like to make a peptide, but you could write the same thing for carbohydrates or for uh, nucleic acids. In all cases, you need to eliminate water to make this polymer. And you know where you don't wanna do that? In the water. <laughs> so, and so it would be nice if you could dry it down to get that to happen and then, um, you need to be in water ultimately for other things to happen, but if you could cycle it through wet dry cycles, which is not crazy, like the sun could come out in the day or it could get hot or whatever. And so we, we really like this idea of having surface water that can wet and dry so that we can oligomerize. If for example, this molecule, when it was longer, got to interact with something else, or I don't know, make it coacervate, then it would be less likely to come back apart during the wet times. And so hit the button. Uh, imagine this is a little pool of rock and inside there's a pond and inside there's polymers and they made RNA rich droplets, my little coacervates, and now we're going to dry it and wet it again. And so I had a postdoc, Hadi, and he designed an experiment that wasn't, you know, in rocks and was involved in oven and glass containers and whatnot. And what he found is depending on his starting conditions, he could have coacervates and then dry it to 10% of its original volume. So now it's been concentrated 10 times and still have coacervates. Or he could start someplace different where he had coacervates and then they would go away. Or he could start someplace where it just barely had coacervates and then they would get more, I guess, bigger. Um, and you could, if you had time, understand this all from the phase diagram. That's why I love it so much. But the thing I want to do instead, hit the button, is say that's a thing that can happen. So you could think about capture and release of RNAs. And here is some RNA inside. When you have the coacervate the whole time, something interesting happens. So here, like the RNA is inside and then it gets released. Like, well, of course, there's no coacervate. Um, but here, the RNA is inside and then the RNA is still inside. Turns out the concentration of RNA inside is the same. And maybe that sounds boring until you realize like, but there's 10 times more RNA there on a molecular, you know, per volume sense. It should have gone up 10 times, but it didn't. It stayed the same inside. It went up, it, it went up outside and the compartments got bigger, but the concentration inside was buffered. And so you can imagine a scenario where that could be beneficial to keep the RNA concentration from wildly fluctuating during a wet dry cycle. So there are things that sort of you wouldn't necessarily predict that come out of this that, that help give us hope that there really were some knobs that could be turned that make some things that seem unlikely become more likely. Okay, hit the button. Okay. Oh, not enough time. Let me just say there are bad things about coacervates. They're liquids. They coalesce. They equilibrate. Hit the button. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we could bring those two things together? Because we had lipids, they made a great boundary, but you couldn't put stuff in. We have coacervates, you can put stuff in, but they don't have a good boundary. Okay, hit the button. Hit the button again. Okay. If you take your dried lipid film and just add your hydrating solution, like water, for example, water with RNA, for example, 
or if you put in coacervates or coacervates with RNA, you can make a membrane either way. If you make the membrane on the coacervates, and I say you bake it, like you just come back and look and there it is, right? Um, first of all, they're kind of beautiful. They're more uniform because they were templated around these beautiful spheres. Oh, that's nice, yeah. Um, and so this is kind of nicer looking than that. That's really just an aesthetic thing. Like these things can hold molecules, whatever. We shouldn't be too picky about them. Hit the button. But here's what we should care about. The RNA is the same amount in both hydrating solutions. But if we didn't have the coacervate, yeah, there's like, there is some inside this much, right? You can hardly see it though. But there's loads of it inside the ones that had the coacervates because it was already in the coacervates. That's where it wants to be. It's desperate to be in the coacervates. So you put it in there. I mean, I say you put it in there, but you just put it in the container and then the RNA, whoop, it's inside. And then you come back and now there's a membrane around it and look at, they're all about the same and they've got loads of RNA inside. And so that works pretty well. The button. And another thing we saw that was kind of interesting is that if you try to put something in after you form the membrane, now you're asking, so the first question is like, did the, did the coacervate help the membrane? Yes, it puts stuff inside. But does the membrane help the coacervate? What if the stuff's not already inside and it comes later? It's the same stuff, the same blue, it's 15 mer of uridylic acid. It's RNA that's intentionally a long piece of spaghetti. <laughs> Doesn't fold. Um, and you can see these little red rings. Those are all the little liposomes. And only some of them got the red stuff inside, or the... I don't know my colors, the blue stuff inside, the RNA. And that's because these membranes weren't all the same. Some of the membranes are better than others. They formed in the same container at the same time, but some of them are better than others. And when I first saw this, I was like a little distressed because I wanted it to be beautiful. And um, yeah, Bob and I, we tried to make it better. And then we were like, you know what? Actually, it's we should embrace the things that we see, right? This is a thing that happened. We couldn't easily make it better. So then we had to come to grips with it. And if you think about it, this now can compete, right? They're not all the same, which means if whatever the situation they're showing isn't the best situation for this envir environment they find themselves in, some of them could still do whatever needed to be done. Not all of them, they don't all do the same thing. And so this is an opportunity for uh, selection to act on these. But it also keeps them from dying when you add magnesium, but we don't have time for that, so hit the button. Yeah, so, so Phil and I, we think this way. We think, yeah, you could have coacervates, and you could put your cool RNA inside and it could do all the cool things RNA needs to do. It could get longer, which is important. And when it's longer, it could be selectively retained, which is important. It could fold and that folding could be impacted by the compartment and it could be active inside the compartment and then potentially it could get a membrane around it. And so, you know, obviously these are all, you know, question marks you could put everywhere, but we've seen enough to think it's not completely crazy that this kind of thing could happen. But if you hate RNA, I hope no one hates RNA, but if you hate RNA, the whole compartment story doesn't require RNA. <laughs> you can put rocks in your compartments, what's fine. You wish you had a mineral instead, you don't like RNA, fine. Put a rock in your compartment, it's good. <laughs> Hit the button. Those are iron sulfur minerals. Uh, it's supposed to be like hydrothermal vents. Um, and so, yeah, um, why do we do this? We do this because it's fascinating and it's fun and we really enjoy it, but it's part of a broader thing, not just in my lab, but but amongst other people who do this kind of work. We think about how can we learn what molecules wanna do and how can we apply that to understanding today's biology? How can we understand it to apply to new techniques, new biotechnologies, new artificial cells? Can we get new uh, functions out by understanding things better? And also, of course, making these cyto uh, cytoplasm first artificial cells um, where we think about how life might've started. And we may never really figure out how life started, right? But it inspires a lot of work that I think is really interesting and is fun to work on. And it does attract a lot of um, really talented young people to be a part of it. Button. This is just for fun to remember, not just the warm little pond. You could be looking under the surface of Mars. We are looking, we, not me, but like we, all of humanity is looking under the surface of Mars right now. Mars used to have water on top and now there's still water underneath. There are some cool things to think about. Perchlorate lakes really, really salty places. What would happen to the RNA there? Hit the button. The poor little helicopter died last week. It's sad, but, um, and then there's plans. NASA has crazy plans like, oh yeah, moons of Jupiter. Yeah, let's do it. And they're, they're planning on doing it. They're going to go and they're going to like, oh, can we, can we sample these plumes of what we think is water coming from a subsurface ocean? And we can see what kind of molecules might be in there and learn something about life. Like, is there life now on Europa? Was there in the past? Is there like some pre-life thing going on? Uh, you can watch this if you're bored. 
in real time, watch the people in the clean room building it. I've been there in person. It's pretty cool actually to watch the people. There's like a huge like viewing wall. You could just stand and stare at these people all day. They must love that. But you can also watch it on the internet. So uh, hit the button. And if you want to think really wild things that helicopters can do, little tiny helicopters from NASA, they want to send this Dragonfly mission to there, Titan, which is one of Saturn's moons. And it has like ridiculous hydrocarbon environment, also some water like deep down. Um, to think about like, what if you had like a hydrocarbon lake? I was at a NASA meeting a couple of years ago and someone asked me what I thought about a boat designed to float on a hydrocarbon lake. And I was like, what, is this a joke? Like, no, it was not a joke. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I don't, I don't really do any work. These folks do the work. Um, and I hope, I, I'm not gonna reiterate that because we went over time, but I wanna thank NASA for money. I wanna thank the NSF for money. And also our undergraduates, we have some great undergraduates. They've been supported by Penn State's Erickson Discovery Grants to do a lot of this work. And we really appreciate that as well. And so, yeah, thank you all for spending a Saturday morning. Thank you so much, Chris.